Hi everyone, this is Uli at Lulu Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. I'd like to give you a quick tour of our facility. Uh, because this is a virtual tour, I'll be talking and showing the camera at various areas. I can pick up the camera and walk around and give you a tour of our control room and other areas. And uh, I'll be walking around the plant and adding a video that I shot earlier. And I hope you can hear me. So we're going to record this and then give you this tour. But then for the GoTo meeting, I'll be using this as my interconnect source. So, Lulu Island Wastewater Treatment Plant serves about 216,000 people. We're in Richmond, British Columbia, Canada. This is a wastewater treatment plant. It is domestic wastewater. So, we treat municipal domestic wastewater. It's basically what goes down the sewer, down the toilet, the bathtub, the washing machine, any cleaning products used in the house, anything used to clean the floor, everything that's rinsed down the toilet. Uh, we uh, receive the water from 216,000 people and it is a discrete collection system. So that means the street drains and the sewer are separate piping systems. The sewer system comes to our plant the street drains go to the river. So a discrete system, it's fairly modern, so it doesn't leak, so there's not very much infiltration into the discrete system. So when it rains, our flows do not go up enormously. Um, right now is uh, April 10th, 2020, so in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. But because our plant is considered an essential service, we, we staff it. This is a largely automated facility that can run itself, but it can't run itself very long. We have about eight or nine operation staff, about the same for maintenance, a few lab staff and uh, a few management coming to about 24 or 26 people on site at any one time, plus four or five contractors working on various projects. At nighttime, the plant is not manned, it's automatically run. So there's a few things. I hope you have the handout I've given. Uh, it relates to, let me just go get that and see how a handout works. So I hope you can uh, see that right now. I have a couple of handouts for you. I'm repositioned in the control room, the main control room of Lulu Island Wastewater Plants. You should all have this handout, which is basically the tour. It basically, means you don't have to take a lot of notes. Everything I'm going to cover is on these two pages and you should have this handout which is basically some terms you should know by the end of this tour. Very simple, it tells you the terms and what they are. And we're just going to follow along in this tour document and uh, should work fine. So don't look down too much and take notes. Most of this will be handed out to you and your professor should be providing it to you by email. And uh, it's, you know, two and a half pages, very simple. Uh, we're also going to do the tour by walking around the plant a little bit, and I'm going to give you some, uh, a little video of the shots that we have around the plant. So you can actually see how some of our equipment works and what it looks like on the ground. And then we're going to have an interactive question and answer session at the end. Total time about two hours, or maybe a little less since we don't actually, one of the advantages of a go-to meeting is that um, it's more efficient in terms of time. Uh, so it's important that everyone get their technology right, we're all on the same page. So, uh, so as I said, my name is Uli holden -Reed. I'm an operator here. I've had about well, 35 years experience in wastewater. Um, I came to this field because it involves biology. And I'm a biologist by training, as well as other careers. And so I like microscopes and biology and biochemistry, so that's right up my alley. Um, the other side of water treatment is drinking water treatment. This is wastewater treatment. And the third is industrial wastewater treatment. So there are really three kinds of water treatment. Uh, we are talking about municipal wastewater treatment. 
and it involves, we do this with biology, so it's right up my alley. And I've done it all over the world, literally, and I've visited wastewater plants all over the world. And I've had about 10 years experience in this plant here, and from time to time I go out and volunteer around the world in disaster zones with uh, Doctors Without Borders, with Engineers Without Borders, other organizations that respond to disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and of course in war zones too, I have a military background. So usually what people need in a disaster is clean water. So I'm very often involved in drilling wells, making sure people have safe drinking water, and dispose of their waste properly. So it's taught me a lot that, uh, uh, about the fact that the way we do things in the Western world is not the only way. There are many ways to treat water, there are many ways to run a utility, there are many ways to serve the people with their water needs, not just the way we do it here. This is one of many possible ways. So if we look at our, our tour sheet here on the wastewater tour, the first half page is about what is wastewater. Well, you may think you know what that is. It's what goes down the toilet, right? Very simple, human waste. But let's start at the real beginning. So wastewater, of course, is mostly water. I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm sure it's above 99% actually by weight. It's water. So we use water to transport waste to the plant where it's treated as a process stream in various process units. And this is important because we'll learn that waste water is important because it's part of the global water cycle and there's another cycle and that is the human use water cycle and they are distinctive. So we use a subflow of the global water cycle driven by the sun, driven by weather, rain falls on the land, it goes into a lake, it's treated at a water treatment plant, it goes into the pipes, we drink it, we use it, we wash with it, it comes here, we treat it, make it clean again and then we discharge it to the river again. Now we never treat it 100%. We never treat it as well as we got it. So you should be aware that there's a second cycle, the human use cycle. And it's not a full cycle. The natural cycle is a full cycle. It's the same water going round and round. It goes through your body, whether we treat it or not. And it goes through your brain, and that's what you're listening with right now. But there's a second cycle, the human use cycle. And we can do something about that. We can treat it, we can put resources towards treating it, and that's what we're talking about here, and that's where engineering comes in. And how well we do that depends how much we value water. You may be unaware that we value water. You, If you rent or you own property, you pay a utility bill. And on the utility bill, once a year or something, there's a charge for utilities. But that's wastewater treatment. That's where I get my, my fabulous salary from. And so how much do you value water? A few hundred dollars you pay a year? The best way to know how much water treatment is worth to you is to go to a place without it. Is to go to Haiti, where there is no water treatment, where there are no pipes in the ground, where people buy bulk water in plastic bags and people dispose of their waste in the field behind their house or on the ground behind their house. There is no treatment, there are no pipes. And the conditions that this leads to are cholera, dysentery, diphtheria, many other bacterial borne and, and parasitic diseases, and of course cholera. You have to go and visit those places to appreciate the value of water treatment. And You'll see it's a recurring theme in what I say, that water treatment is really worth while. So what is wa wastewater? Well, it's mostly water, but it's also organics, of course. Uh, the first thing we think of is what we put in the toilet. But think about it. It's also all the soap you use. It's all the detergent you use to wash your clothes. It's all the chemicals and cosmetics you put on your skin because they all end up in the water. It's everything you drink. If you drink alcohol, it goes down the wastewater. If you eat food, it goes down the wastewater. If you eat, eat anything with grease in it or 
of fat or oils, like a Big Mac, it goes into the wastewater. If you take drugs of any sort, birth control pills, ibuprofen, any kind of drug of any sort, it ends up in the wastewater because many of these are synthetic organic compounds that don't deteriorate very quickly in a biological treatment plant. So we need to think about that. That includes plastic. A great deal of plastic goes down the, the drain. Uh, it's what we wash our clothes with. When we wash clothes, it goes down as lint into the drain, ends up in the plant. Thousands of tons a year. Uh, large plastic items, such as this mouse, they're made of plastic, they become microplastic. They're ground up into small pieces of plastic. They deteriorate, they become brittle, they turn to dust, plastic dust. And they roll down the pipes and end up here. And eventually, if we don't capture them and treat them, they end up in the environment where they become sequestered, usually in the bodies of living organisms. Wood, I've seen two by four cell phones. You know, my sister lives in, used to live in New York and she'd be on the phone, she's a gabber. And here she was having this hour-long conversation. She wouldn't hang up. She needed to talk. So uh, big brother, I listened to my baby sister. And then there'd be an oh no, and a fumble, and a splash, and the phone would go dead. And then I'd hear the, the flush sound, sort of gurgling. So phones, goldfish. What would you do with a dead goldfish? Think for a moment. Yeah, we get those. Wallets. Paul was out from diapers. I've seen diapers come into the plants. Flushable wipes. We've all seen these. These are flushable wipes. No, they don't say that anymore. But in this COVID-19 times, we're using a lot of these, right? We're using disinfection. Does this say flushable? It certainly does not. They've now taken that off. It's a wet wipe, but they are definitely not flushable. But we see tons of them come in. Money. Sometimes we get some money. I'll show you a little piece of it. Not a lot. Uh, grit. What is grit? Grit is sand. Inorganic material. Eggshells, coffee grounds, dirt that you wash off your body and your clothes. And a little bit of grit that gets into the broken pipes. They are broken sometimes and silt and sand wash in. Chemicals of all types, fogs, uh, fats, oils, greases, lots of that. Tons and tons of it. And so lots of things come down, but it's mostly water. That's what sewage is. So why do we treat it? Well, we've talked about that. We treat it because we are basically in the pub public health industry. Yeah? We treat wastewater because it's public health related. If we didn't, public health would dramatically decline. There would be plagues and epidemics. So our first priority is to protect the public health, and our second priority is to protect the environment. So as an operator, I have a third priority, and that's to do what my boss tells me to do. We need to run the plant according to certain standards, and today your job is this. But always our first two priorities. It's also the law. In Canada and most developed countries, the law says you must treat wastewater. You can't just dump it. People do if they can get away with it. But the law prohibits it. So there is a regulatory environment that teaches us that we must treat wastewater. And we get billions of dollars to do it. And so, of course, they monitor how we spend that money to make sure that we're doing a good job. And large cities just wouldn't be livable without wastewater treatment. <clears throat> a single person can live in the woods, they can just dig a latrine pit. A thousand people can just find a, maybe a little pond at the back of the village. The metro area around Shanghai is approaching 40 million people. They have 10 of the biggest wastewater treatment plants in the world. And I think they're building three more. So, we absolutely must treat wastewater to make our urban lifestyle possible. You know, types of wastewater treatment. Well, there are many, many types. There are many ways to do the same job over and over. 
It depends on the context. Let's take a break here. I need to push pause. Oh yeah. So there are many ways to treat, depending on the context. So in the third world, where there's no money and no skills, they do it the cheaper way and the simpler way, which I highly recommend. I personally am an advocate of a technique called constructive wastelands. It's very simple. A bunch of men with shovels and a very simple lab can treat wastewater. You need the land, you need the will, but you don't need computers. I've actually worked in wastewater plants where there are no computers, where there's no electricity. You really actually don't need that. Um, in Dubai, the water temperature in the wastewater plant, the process temperature is 36 degrees Celsius on the hottest days. So the bacteria work twice as fast with every 10 degree rise in temperature. So with our temperature here in Lulu at about 22 degrees, at 36 degrees, that means they need half the land surface to treat twice the water, or the, the same amount of water. So they need half the resources. Uh, up in the north, in Fort McMurray, it's 40 below, minus 40 Celsius. So the wastewater plant has to be very small and fit inside a building. So there you need a small footprint. So every area has different constraints. Sometimes you don't have technical skills available. Sometimes they're very expensive. Here in the Western world, highly skilled technicians cost a lot. So we try to minimize staffing. In the third world, it's pretty cheap to get labor. So, you know, uh, how do you treat wastewater? Well, there are many ways. And you will, if you travel the world, you will see many different ways of en answering this engineering challenge. Old ways, new ways, but none of them is the best. They are each uniquely situated, uh, suited to their unique context. So, one of the ways to treat wastewater, they, they all pretty much involve three methods. They involve, in order of process, physical method. That means we basically settle solids out. That removes about half the pollution. That is called primary treatment. Very easy, it's very simple, but you need big gigantic tanks for it to sit still and settle for hours. The second method is biological. The second method, there are three, biological. So biological uses bacteria to eat the remaining pollution. And that removes up to about 98, 97% of the pollution. And chemical method is the third method. Chemical uses polymer, and chlorine bleach and sulfur dioxide gas to disinfect the wastewater so no bacteria get into the river. And so we use three methods, physical, chemical, biological, physical, biological, chemical, in that order. Another thing is that the plant is physically divided into different areas. So primary treatment is physical settling. That's one whole section of the plant with buildings associated with it. Secondary treatment is biological. That's a whole section of the plant with buildings associated with it. And disinfection, where the, the chemical is used somewhere else, but the disinfection part of the plant is a whole separate section with buildings associated with it. That's three areas. And the fourth is dewatering. Every wastewater plant produces sludge, and sludge needs to be treated. It's again treated with biology, and then it's dewatered with chemicals, including polymer, and it's made into a soil like substance called cake. And so that's another large section of the plant. That's about half the plant. It's called dewatering or sludge treatment. So you're going to find those four areas in most plants primary treatment, secondary treatment, primary is settling mechanical, secondary treatment is biology bacteria, disinfection area, and sludge treatment or dewatering. You're going to find all that. So there is primary and secondary treatment. There's such a thing called tertiary treatment, which can remove nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. And in some 
jurisdictions, that is required as well. So that requires a different process, an additional process. We don't do it here, but it's coming. The standards are going up all the time. There's even quaternary treatment, where they remove pollutants of emerging concern, such as Tylenol and organic compounds, and someday coronavirus and anything else that's in the water. You know, exotic, organic, synthetic molecules that biological treatment usually doesn't remove. Quick tour, we're halfway through the paperwork, so we're now on page two. How can we treat wastewater around the world? Page two, very simple. Remember, I'm waiting for you to ask questions, so that'll come. Please write down your questions, because you have to remember them long enough. We'll have discussions later. So as we zip through this part, we're going to have a discussion later. And <coughs> this tour is, is tailored to your needs. So you're an engineering student, so you have a scientific background, so you're pretty smart. So I'm expecting you to ask really smart questions. You know, they used to say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, it's true. It's, in the real world, that's very true. So cultivate a network. You've probably heard that already. But believe me, if you're an engineering student, it really helps to know something, which will really inform you to ask the right questions. It's not what you know, it's the questions you ask. If you ask the right questions, you're way ahead than the man who knows the right answers, believe it or not. The right questions will allow you indefinite future expansion. The right answers will allow you to pass the job interview. But really asking the right questions ensures your future. So please ask questions. A lot of what I'm saying is a rush job and you're getting a quick dose of information and you may wonder, well, what about this? And what about, write it down now. I will get to it. So we are now in the section for how can we treat wastewater around the world? Well, as I alluded to earlier, there are many ways to treat wastewater. Wastewater can be treated depending on the context. How much money do you have? How much land do you have? How skilled is your workforce? Do you live in a tropical or a, a polar region? What kind of wastewater? Is it industrial wastewater? Is it domestic or is it largely combined systems, like where the sewers are combined with street drains, where there's a lot of grit, sand, and gravel in the wastewater. So how you treat wastewater really is a function of what's coming into the plant and all those other factors. So the most common thing in the world, and throughout all of human history, there's about 8 billion people in the world, give or take, and really most of them don't treat their wastewater. Remember, people like you and me who live in the first world are the rich world. They're going to be engineered, engineers, they're educated. They don't live in the third or fourth world. They live in the first world. But most people, especially in the future, will live in the third world. They are the disenfranchised. Most people in human history were one of those. So they didn't treat any wastewater. They just dump it out of sight is out of mind. That's what most people have done to treat wastewater throughout human history. And you may think, oh, that's horrible. That's, that's the evil third world where people don't know any better. Well, the people know perfectly well that wastewater is very effective. Our beautiful province of British Columbia, Canada, has the capital city of Victoria, Canada. Our capital city of the most beautiful province in Canada does not treat its wastewater. They just dump it in the ocean. So don't be too haughty about it. Don't think, oh, we're Canada, we do things better. No. One of the most enlightened countries in the world. We do one of the most horrible jobs of treating wastewater in our capital city. We dump it in the ocean. We don't treat it at all. So that's why I wrote one of the things you can do with wastewater is don't treat it. They do it just a few miles from here. They, believe me, they're changing it real fast. They're building a big new expensive plant that'll hire lots of people. We also use latrines, which is just a pit in the ground with a seat over it. Uh, most places just dump it in a ditch. In New York City, one of the biggest cities in the world, for most of the last century, they treated wastewater in the sludge. They just drove in big barges to the ocean and dumped it in the ocean. So 
we are slowly learning to treat wastewater. In many wastewater plants don't actually work. In the Middle East, they have wastewater plants. Not many of them don't actually work. What goes in is pretty much what goes out. They look good. There's a few people with jobs there. But for many years, the Beirut, a, a city of more than a million people, did not, uh, not Beirut, uh, uh, Baghdad, Iraq, didn't have wastewater treatment. They have one of the best plants in the world, built by the U.S. Corps of Engineers, excellent plant, but it was bombed. So the plant just flowed into the Tigris River, uh, the, the Euphrates River, and there was no treatment. Many places in the Middle East and much of Africa, they don't have treatment. Now, many places can do preliminary treatment. So preliminary treatment is where you have screens about this big, and anything big will get caught, like a, a diaper or two by four, or big things like rags. And there's a scraper which just scrapes them clean and puts them in a bin. That's screening. And some have grit removal because grit, remove, uh, grit destroys pumps and motors and pipes. It's like sandblasting. It literally eats the pipes from the inside. And so preliminary treatment is screening and grit removal. Victoria, B.C. doesn't even use that. They just dump it in the ocean. All right. There is preliminary treatment and the use of a constructed wetland. It's used in many smaller towns in Canada. It's very effective. It just takes some real estate. But it's low cost. Small town governments use it. It's effective. You usually have to put a fence around the wetland. And it's a sewage pond. And if properly designed, it actually treats the water pretty well. And then there's preliminary treatment, primary treatment. Well, primary treatment is just settling it in a clarifier for several hours after preliminary treatment. Iona, one of the biggest plants in the lower mainland, near the airport, it treats much of the water from wastewater from uh, Vancouver, Canada, is a primary treatment plant. The Lionsgate plant under the Lionsgate Bridge is a primary treatment plant. So they have preliminary tra uh, treatment. They strain, they remove grit, and they do primary treatment. They settle it out and digest the sludge. Primary treatment. It removes more than half the pollution. It's pretty good. Nowadays, the minimum standard is secondary. So you get preliminary, primary, and then secondary treatment. We use biology. This removes up to 97%, 98% in this plant of the pollution. This works very well. Um, but in the future, the standards are going to be raised again. So that's a secondary level treatment plant. There's also tertiary treatment where you do all that and then you remove phosphorus and nitrogen because that could pollute certain very pure waters and cause algal blooms. So that's coming. That's the next future for us. And then there's quaternary treatment where you remove synthetic organic compounds that I mentioned earlier. There are many ways to do it. There are many types of processes that we can use. Remember the process is comprised of process units, like a tank with a, with a process in it, and then it goes to the next tank with a process in it. A series of process units, and you have continuous flow treatment. Some plants also use batch processing. They fill a tank and they treat it, and then they empty that tank and a new batch comes in. And they do everything in one tank and many technologies exist. Metro Vancouver and this plant use a process called trickle filter solids contact tank process. It's one type of secondary treatment and you will see exactly what I mean by that. So <clears throat> we're now at the bottom of this where it says about Lulu Island wastewater treatment plant. The plant is owned by a local level of government, Metro Vancouver. It's a regional level of government, so we're not a city, we're not a province, regional government level. Uh, in Canada we have federal, then provincial, then regional government, then municipalities. So we're at the regional level. Uh, remember these are multi-billion dollar infrastructure investments. They usually get federal loans, they usually get supported by federal grants to build them and then local tax base to support them. Uh, and this industry works in a regulatory environment. I mean, 
we have to work in a regulatory environment. The provincial government, the federal government, the municipality, all of regulations that we must follow, you know. We have a permit to operate, which is 4545, which means we can discharge maximum of 45 milligrams per liter of biochemical oxygen demand, the strength of the wastewater, and a maximum of 45 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids. We're usually averaging about 8 to 12. Right at this moment, we're at 5.5 milligrams per liter. Well, that's pretty good. That's a very clean water going into the river. And um, so that's what the province gives us. The BC, WorkSafe BC tells us how to operate. We deal with dangerous chemicals, confined spaces, electrical equipment. There are safety standards we have to adhere to. The federal government has a salmon stream, the Fraser River, where people catch salmon and sell it for food. We have to make sure we don't pollute their salmon stream. So we're covered by many layers of regulations, and our work is constantly monitored. So if you sell cigarettes, so you're on a corner store, you don't deal with this level of regulation. So, uh, we must follow the law. In other words, we are being watched. We've been here since about 1973, so about a 50-year-old plant. And the last upgrade, you upgrade these plants every few decades. So the last upgrade was about 20 years ago, roughly. And so this plant is fairly modern and functions very well. Its update date is coming up again. Time for another upgrade. But right now, we're pretty modern and pretty well placed and we function very well. So we're not an old, obsolete, junky plant. We're sort of low down on the list of priorities. Other plants definitely need upgrades. They were upgraded last in the 50s or 60s. They need an upgrade. So when I talk about pollution, it's an easy way, but I'm not dumbing it down. I'm just using a practical term. When I mean pollution, I mean biochemical oxygen demand, BOD. The strength of the wastewater, how polluted is the water. So that's what I mean by pollution. It also means total suspended solids, TSS. It is how cloudy the water is. So if you remove the BOD and you remove the TSS, you have clear, unpolluted water. Very simple. I can make it more complicated, but that's about it. Right? Why, why make it unnecessarily complicated? We treat about 78 megaliters a day of domest domestic wastewater from a separated sewer system. And um, we, it would take about a billion dollars to replace this plant, probably twice that nowadays. And it costs about $10 million a year to run it, with mostly staffing, electricity, because we pump water, and trucking, and a bit for chemicals. And yes, I make $10 million a year. And uh, so this is a biological, primary is, is physical, secondary is biological, sludge treatment and disinfection is chemical. But we consider ourselves a biological treatment plant. There are other ways, remember. There's chemical plants that use just chemicals. They do a really good job. They just use a lot of expensive chemicals. Um, there's also physical plants that use membranes. You can just filter the water and literally remove the H2O from the wastewater and you get clean H2O, pretty much pure water. Whatever's left is something else, but pure water goes in the river. It's another possibility. But this one is a biological treatment plant. So we use many kinds of bacteria to do this job. Uh, we've recently done a genetic engineering study on the, the a genomic study on the bacteria that are working in our plant. And we have identified hundreds of species of bacteria. There are probably hundreds of thousands of species that are active. But we have, it's fairly easy to identify several hundred that are active, 145 that are active. And of those, about 45 are the big heavy lifters. They do most of the eating of the pollution.
and get big and fat and then they can be settled out in clarifiers and so we remove the pollution. We do this with bacteria. And of course, since I'm a microbiologist, I like to talk about bacteria, so you'll be hearing about those. We serve about a quarter of a million people. It goes up and down depending on the season. We are an automated facility, and it works unmanned at night. And as I said, about 25, 26 people, eight operators, eight maintenance, a few lab and management staff. And look, the, the drone of my voice is almost over. We're down to the last part, so we're almost finished. But then begins the interesting part waiting for your questions. So we, um, the five fingers of the head, primary treatment, secondary treatment, which is bacteria, dewatering, which is sludge treatment, disinfection, that's the other one, oh preliminary, yeah, preliminary where we screen and remove grit, then primary, then secondary, then disinfection, and then sludge treatment. Five fingers of the hand. So, how do you treat wastewater? I just gave you a lesson. You're experts. Right there. Five fingers of the hand. It's easy to remember. Study those. Five, just some points to remember here along the bottom, which is down at the very bottom part. Points to remember key things to take away. We're going to, we're going to review these uh, terms to remember, because you should all know these by now. But five points to remember. We are funded by the government, public money. And whenever you're publicly funded, you must be held accountable. So we have to prove that we're doing a good job. We take samples. This is what's coming in, about 240 to 400 milligrams per liter of BOD. This is what's going out, about five milligrams per liter at this moment. So. We have to be able to prove that with lab tests in a certified lab, which we have. Uh, we must be good corporate citizens, because just across the street is a person living in their house. So we can't stink too much, we can't make noise, we have to have a nice looking facility that's clean and neat. We must uh, treat wastewater in a socially responsible manner. <coughs> Excuse me, what does that mean? That's a favorite of mine. It means we have to be open and public, and we have to do it efficiently. We can't use $20 million or $50 million when $8 million will do the job. We can't just make the water disappear and just dump it in the ocean. Actually, what Victoria is doing is socially irresponsible. They're fixing it. The fix is in the works, but that, was not, that should not have been allowed. <coughs> And we have to be able to explain to people and teach people about water so that they pollute less, that they put less plastic in the water, that they think twice before pouring their oil change down the sewer. We have to make sure that people are part of this, that they are aware that what goes into the wastewater plant has to either be treated or go into the ocean and be part of the environment. So I think we're all in this together. Education and engagement with the public is a big part of what we do. At this facility, we're a research facility, so we treat wastewater, that's our primary goal. It's public health, and then protect the public health and, and protect the environment. <coughs> but we also do research. We combine with private companies and the university. We do test projects here, pilot projects. We work with other utilities. We try to do it in a more socially responsible manner. We don't try to waste gas like methane gas which is a greenhouse gas. We're trying to capture that and sell it and avoid polluting. And final point. We're done with this page. The final point. We are here forever. I will be here forever. Maybe not. But this plant will be. As long as people are here, we're going to have to treat wastewater. This city's been here a little over 100 years. We're going to be treating wastewater for hundreds and hundreds of years. Probably different technologies. We will rebuild the plant. But anything we produce has to be managed for hundreds and hundreds of years, for thousands of years, forever. So everything we do is forever. When you buy a car, it's not forever. It'll eventually be sold, 
it'll eventually go through many owners and then it'll be rusted junk and it'll go to a junkyard may get recycled but it'll be in the environment we are here forever if we produce 40,000 kilograms of sludge every two days that's forever we're building mountains of it we better have a way to deal with it all right last piece of paper and points to remember we're going to go through this and you should be able to answer this because there will be a test your professor has told me that these 10 questions are not tough enough he's going to really push you and I'm going to go through these 10 points but I'm going to add some bonus questions or you know definitions that you should be writing down because if I were your professor I'd push hard what is wastewater well it's sewage you should know what that is influent Influent is what comes in, effluent is what goes out. So each process unit, and remember there are process units, flow is continuous, it goes in, it's influent, it goes out, it's effluent, and just after that it's influent to another process unit. And that's how it goes all the way through the process. That's also how it goes through the plant. There's an inlet into the plant and an outlet out of the plant. It's all the same thing. Influent, effluent is the same water. Of course it's treated, so it's changed bacteria. When I say bugs that eat pollution, well these are not insects. A bug is actually a type of insect. But we mostly rely on bacteria. There are fungi, there are um, archaea, a kind of bacteria. Uh, one of the domains of life is archaea and bacteria. Settling tank. Well, it settles to remove the sludge. Any big tank where the sewage sits for three, four, five hours. Right now it's sitting Live on the air. Plant retention times. Primary set tank, 2.18 hours. Plant flow right now is 80 megaliters. So we get a high point and a low point. The average is about 78 megaliters a day. So current time is 7:30 at evening. There's no staff here, but currently we're going up. The evening rush is coming. Clarifies. It's a kind of settling tank and you keep it in there longer for about four hours. Current time in clarifiers is uh, five hours. It just sits there and settles. It becomes nice and clear. Sludge. The dirty mud that settles up. That's all it is. There are many kinds of sludge. There's good sludge, there's bad sludge. But it's what settles on the bottom. It's the sediment. And we have to treat that. It's still mostly water, but we have to now digest that and treat that. We can't just throw that away. It's very polluted. Receiving water. Well, receiving water is the Fraser River and the ocean, a, few, a couple of kilometers from here. So receiving water is what we put our partially treated wastewater into. Remember, we're part of the water cycle. We take a substream of the human use cycle we partially treat it pretty good but it's not perfect not as pure as rain and then it goes into the ocean where the rest of the treatment happens and it becomes part of the larger planetary water cycle aeration you see an aquarium you see the air stone the little blue air stone and the bubbles coming up that's aeration and in an aquarium you do it to circulate the water in our case we have very fine bubbles and we do it to add oxygen to the water because, here's the, one of the bonus points, we use an aerobic process. It means oxygen is added. The bacteria that use an aerobic pro process are much, much more efficient than anaerobic processes. Most of our process in the biofilm and the trickle filter is aerobic. So that's about 10 times more efficient than the equivalent anaerobic. Efficiency means you need 10 fewer trickle filters. 10 times less space to do the same amount of treatment. In our sludge treatment, we use anaerobic digesters, no oxygen, because we want to produce methane gas that we then sell. So there we use an anaerobic process, another bonus word you should know and use. And that's it for the tour part, uh, for the paperwork part. If you remember these terms and are able to answer these questions, you, you've got the A on the little test that's coming. And now, 
it's a one-way ticket so we're going to take a walk around the plant we'll start with this control room I'll show you a few things and then I'll show you a little video that I did of the plant of all the major process units and then we'll open it up to the public I'll be looking at my computer screen and you'll all be able to answer my questions and you will ask me questions and of course I will try to answer yours and that's how we'll end and then it's lunchtime so let's try that shot we? so this is one of three control rooms at the Lulu Island semi-automated wastewater treatment facility domestic wastewater discrete collection system just households not much industry 216,000 about a quarter of a million people it's each plant is actually unique just like each person is unique this is a Chinese city so we get Chinese wastewater the other city Iona is Vancouver Vancouver is not primarily a Chinese city there are other areas which have different cultures and you can actually see the difference in the wastewater it actually makes sense so let's take a little look around the, com the control room here. I'll do a little pause and set up some things and then uh, I'll shut her down. All right. So I'll physically pick you up here and hopefully you can see me here. So this is a uh, program we use in our control room. It's called Process Book, which you can begin to see it's just a big screen with a bunch of stuff on it and if we oh that's the wrong mouse we've got like 10 mice here we go so if you go closer you can see all kinds of things and you can you know, zero in on a, a trend and learn about it and this one is for oh what is it present value of digester feed flow, digester level, digester standpipe level, digester gas pressure, digester heat exchange unit, in, inlet temperatures, and so on. We also use various CDAC system, which is an industrial IT control system in our plant. And here's one of the screens for that. Let me get you down on this. I hope you can see that. So it's grayscale for a reason because when you see a color like right there, right there, I don't know if you can see that, color means something's wrong. So this is our chlorination system. It says our current flow is 78.8 megaliters. Chlorine level is 0.99 milligrams per liter. We use Sistema Internacional, that is the metric system here. The engineering units are percents, kilopascals, liters per minute, megaliters per day, milligrams per liter, and so, meters, and so on. Minutes, time, and if we click through and we find a page with a color, any color like that bad, I don't know if you can see that color there, that means something's wrong. In this case, there are two meters. This one is not reading anything. These blue dots mean something's wrong and we need to change it or look into it. There's a low pressure on this fan. It's running, but it's not actually doing anything. So we need to look into that. So we have the ability to flick through these screens. Uh, there's a whole unit here, a process unit that is out of service. There's lots of color there. So many of the systems in this plant have redundant systems. So here are two daft units. One is running, the other is on standby. The lower one is running. Here's one. Let me just find this one. Our influent pump station. So here we have one, two, three, four, five pumps. Main raw sewage lift pumps. Only two of them are running right now. We have backups and redundant systems. Let's go to our trickle filters. This is the trickle filter page. So you see we have four large trickle filters, but one of them is out of service. The, the second one from the left because it's being maintained. So we have redundant process units. Each one of these is a process unit. We also have the ability to trend. Let's go to the influent pump station, primary set tank. Let's go to our flow down here and trend that. And we see trending. And you see this wave pattern. This is the daily camel. You see there are two humps on each day. 
the morning rush and the afternoon rush. We are now rising on this last rush going into the afternoon rush because that's the highest low of the day. And then it'll go down at 6 a.m., that's the lowest low of the day. So by trending backwards in time, we can see when something happened right there. And we can ask what happened there. There's a little blip. <coughs> and so in this way, this is our industrial IT that can really help us understand what's going on in the plant. Let me walk around a little bit. We have a control room. All our certifications for our operators have to be up at all times. We have lockout stations where we lock out equipment to safely access it. We have, of course, hard hats. We have a beautiful view of the outside of the plant. <coughs> we have security cameras because this is a restricted facility and uh, everything is alarmed, so there should be no people here at certain times. We have a conference room, a foreman's office. So, um, a typical day here in the plant working at it. So, let's a quick look around the control room. Uh, we're now going to switch to a short movie I took of all our process units, and then we're going to put this down and you will be talking to me and telling me some of the things you think about. And I'll be very happy to try to answer your questions. So let's call this the end of part one. Uh, and then you'll get to watch the little video of me walking around the plant, showing you the different areas that we've been talking about. And then we'll come back to the conference room and you'll be inter able to interact and we'll have some closing thoughts. And then of course, lunch, most important. Remember, there's a wickedly evil test coming at the end. Your professor is licking his lips there in anticipation of how tough it is going to be, so I wouldn't underestimate him. Talk to you later.